Hello, all your Moneyline Media fans. I am joined today by Logan Paulson. Thank you for coming on, Logan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Very excited. Now, you've had a pretty lengthy career, um, especially with the now Washington football team. Uh, but before we even get into the Washington football team and and the radio work you're doing now, I want to kind of take all the way back to your uh, recruitment out of high school and why you chose UCLA. Yeah, so you know, I was a um, I was a soccer player growing up, and that's what I wanted to be, and that was my passion. That's where I envisioned my path taking me. And then uh, my sophomore junior year, we had a new high school football coach, and he kind of said, "Hey, I think you should really look at this football thing." I was playing football at the time, but at the time, it was really just kind of to make friends. You know, my dad signed me up without asking me, kind of thing, and. I said, OK. And he was a guy who kind of who really believed in me and um, pushed me very hard and uh, gave me an opportunity uh, to be successful in college. And uh, so I ended up having I don't remember exactly. It was a long time ago, probably 14, 15 offers, something like that. Oh, and I wow. kind, of kind of narrowed it down to, um, you know, Stanford, Duke and Harvard or not Harvard and UCLA. And um and my family is a bunch of very smart people. Academics are very important to them and they prioritize that. So that's kind of what kind of focused me at the time with this, with in, in school selection. And then it really, the, the deciding factor for me was that at the time UCLA was the most competitive of those four schools, you know, um, Stanford was really bad. I think they'd won one game in like two years or something like yeah. that. And then uh, Duke was kind of the same way. They were just kind of starting their program. It was before they, kind of had any kind of notoriety nationally for their football program and um, Harvard I honestly like uh, they didn't do financial aid at the time or you know like so that it was like $45,000 a semester when I was going there so you know I couldn't put that on my parents to kind of help me out with that so and UCLA is a great school and beautiful campus and it's about 25 minutes from where I grew up so it felt like a very natural fit for me. Were your parents able to go to most of the games too? Yeah, they were, you know, the UCLA, I don't know how familiar you are, but you know, the campus is in Westwood and they play out in Pasadena, which is about an hour away, okay. which is actually a little closer to where my parents live. So they'd kind of make the trek out to the games every weekend. And uh, my wife, or uh, my girlfriend at the time was that my wife always joked, like they always sat in the sunniest section of the stadium. And <laughs> all, you'd see them after the games, they'd come back with these crazy sunburns and stuff. So um, it was, uh, it was, it was a great experience for me, you know, to have my parents come to all the games and stuff like that. Who was uh, the crazier fan, your, your your mom or your dad? Well, my parents are both kind of, uh, they're both from New England. They're both from Boston. So oh. they have this uh, kind of very conservative, like old school New England conservative uh, kind of streak to them. But uh, I would say in terms of like cheering and stuff, my mom gets very, uh, you know, emotional and, and up, uppity, especially when she's at the game. So I'd always hear stories from my younger brother about how mom and you know, lost her mind for a second during, during some portion of the game. Um, so after you, your UCLA uh, experience, your UCLA career, you were in for the 2010 NFL draft. What was the pre-draft process like for you? So I had kind of an interesting experience. I don't know how much you know about this, but um, I had broken my foot my true senior year. And so I missed the entire year. And I had a lot of interest going into that Um going into that year and but you know I kind of missed the whole year and then I kind of came back for a redshirt senior year and all of that interest had kind of dissipated and uh, during my time at UCLA we had a lot of corner uh, quarterback turnover and other variables like that we had five offensive coordinators in five years like not a lot of consistency offensively and so I, I was not really expecting to get drafted or anything but I had an agent approach me he was a really good guy one of my good friends to this day and he kind of said, I think, you know, here's a shot. I'll pay for your training. And I got ready for my pro day and did my pro day. And then the draft came and I didn't get drafted, which wasn't super disappointing because I wasn't expecting to get drafted. And it kind of came down uh, to the Washington football team, obviously formerly the Redskins and then San Diego. And my, my tight end coach, my freshman year of college, actually, who recruited me to UCLA was a tight end coach in Washington. And I thought there's a guy who's going to advocate for me and really push, uh, push for me if I do have an opportunity to make the team. And so I kind of went, even though it was far away, right. I made the decision to go with Washington. So um, we, we've been interviewing a lot of uh, NFL draft prospects of recently. Um, sure. Can you give any advice to them? We're hoping that they all get drafted, obviously. But if they don't get drafted, 
can you give any advice to them on, on, on that it's not over yet or or yeah absolutely i think in some ways you know a lot of people say my goal is to get drafted and i understand that if you're a high pick you know uh, first, second day type of talent that's going to get drafted then. But honestly, if you're picked after the fifth round, in some ways it's better to be an undrafted guy because you get to pick the best situation that fits you and the, the best opportunity for you. You can kind of look at the, the depth chart and say to yourself, you know, the numbers here look pretty good. Like there's only two tight ends. Like that was kind of my situation. There was only two kind of established tight ends in Washington, Fred Davis and Chris Cooley at the time. And I kind of said like those other guys, they're they're kind of – free agent type guys, free agent veterans. And my agent was like, you know, that's a good spot because no one solidified that third spot yet. And I was able to pick that as opposed to having it defined for me. And that was something that was really fantastic. And I would say that for all those guys who don't get drafted, it's definitely not over. I think it's a little bit more difficult now because of the abridged off season and because of COVID to make your impression the way you need to. But I think, you know, make a good decision. And then when you get there, like make a good impression. It's like the biggest job interview you've ever been on. So take advantage of it. Um, and it, your first career touchdown came from a guy that I think is probably one of the most underrated quarterbacks of all time, Donovan McNabb. What was that like yeah. for you? Uh, that was really cool. You know, my mom is a Syracuse grad, and so oh. she was a big uh, Donovan McNabb fan. And so, like, I had kind of always – I wasn't – you know, I said I was a soccer player, but I'd always kind of followed certain players in the NFL. Like, my dad was a pretty big football fan. And uh, we just kind of followed, you know, different pe- different players with different teams, not, not a specific team, because in L.A. at the time, there was no football team. And now we've got right. two. Look at that. So, um, uh, so I always kind of had my eye on Donovan McNabb. And then I got to meet him in person. And it was kind of like one of those kind of welcome to the NFL moments a little bit. Like, you're like, here's a guy that I've been watching since I was pretty little, you know, and right. here I'm getting to play football with him. It was a pretty awesome experience just to share a locker room and then to get that first touchdown from him like I got a ball signed from him that that ball that I scored with I got it signed by him and dated and I gave it to my mom for Christmas and she was super excited so it's a big big part of a big memory for our family and really cool experience that that is an awesome experience uh something that I'm sure a lot of people do not get to say so that you're you're in the rarity uh so during one of your seasons unfortunately Chris Cooley was injured Fred Davis was, I believe, suspended something, and, and you got to kind of part of the season be the first string tight end. Yeah. What was what was that like for you? That was really cool, and I think it was just um, one of those things where, like, I had prepared the whole time like I was going to be the starter, and I know that's you hear that all the time, but that was really the only way I could keep my edge mentally was just, like, one day you're going to have a shot, and it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, it might be four years from now, but what happens when you get that shot? And I – And it really scared me to death to think that I wouldn't be ready for that opportunity. So when it did come, like I was super prepared, like probably overly prepared. And it allowed me to play confident and allowed me to play like stress free because I I wasn't worried about any expectations because everyone's like, he's the third guy. Right. Doesn't matter how he does, you know, and I had just done a good job of making sure I was on the playbook and knew my role and knew what knew the techniques and things like that, even though I wasn't getting a ton of reps. And like, I was just, super grateful for that mental edge because it's something that really defined my career as an undrafted guy not only that in that moment but the entirety of my time in the NFL you bring up the entirety of your time in the NFL and um, when you stop with Washington you kind of uh, went around from a couple different teams what were yeah. each of those teams experiences like for you oh I mean, that's a that's like a five-year question right there yeah. <laughs> uh, the uh, so I think right after I went to Chicago and in a way it was a really good start. I met one of my best friends in the NFL, uh, Frank Smith. He's now the offensive line coach for the San Diego chargers uh, or not San Diego, the LA chargers. And um, you know, one of the best years for me in terms of like just growing as a player, because I got to kind of get out of the expectations of the Washington football team. And not that I'm ungrateful or I had a bad experience there, but it just was a good, way to kind of get me out of my comfort zone and kind of force me to grow. And then I had a, I got to go to San Francisco after that, which I was really excited about because I was kind of reuniting with Kyle Shanahan. And, um, and that was a really tough year. I was a third string tight end and I got cut and re-signed three times in that season. Yeah. That's... And I had to, yeah, I had to move my, I moved my family out there. Then I got cut 
And then we stayed, then I got cut again, I moved them back. And so then I ended up spending half the year away from them. And I ended up living in like a hostel out there in San Francisco. <laughs> it was like an Airbnb, like a single family home that had been like kind of chopped up into rooms. And so I lived oh. in, a, in a single family home with 15 other people who I didn't know for eight weeks out of the season. So that was tough, but uh, I've had some great... Not Go quite ahead. the luxury of the, the NFL that, that people see <laughs> where they, a veteran right. guy. Is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the other thing is like out in San Francisco or San Jose, like the, the property values are just insane. So, yeah. you know, you can't just kind of, you know, like even though I'm making good money, it doesn't go very far because I've got another home and right, uh, right. kind of live in half the year there or whatever. So anyway, so that was, that was cool. It was really, really challenging, emotionally, very challenging for me. Um, and then, um, but I met some really great people. I learned a lot of good football. And then I went to Atlanta and Atlanta was fantastic. Really just an awesome experience. Great culture there. You know, there was always kind of this cloud looming over the organization because, um, you know, everyone kind of knew Dan Quinn was on the hot seat the whole time right. I was there. And obviously he was just fired this last season, which is too bad because he's a great guy. But, um, you know, that was the last, that was the, the first time in my life that I started to kind of get bored or not bored. That's the wrong word. Uh, football became like work to me a little bit near the right. tail end of that season. I was away from my family again for the third year in a row. And, um, you know, I, I forgot, totally forgot about this, but in Chicago, like my wife was pregnant the whole time and she stayed in Virginia, you know, so I was away from them. My son was three years old. And then we did the move after the baby was born to San Francisco. And then I was away from them again. And so then I was away for the third year uh, just because I wasn't sure if I was going to make the team. And that's kind of the gamble you're playing as an undrafted guy is like, right. do you have an opportunity to be on this team? And am I going to move my family, change schools, change doctors, do the whole thing, and then have to go back to where we came from. And so we kind of hedged it because uh, I didn't think I was going to play there for two years. And then I had a pretty good year. I had played through a, a pretty bad injury and I kind of wish I hadn't because I think it affected my tape in a bad way but great experience another great tight end coach there in Wade and met the guys down there in that room were just fantastic people um, I roomed with a guy who played rugby he was on like the European transfer program oh really and so I learned a ton about uh, rugby we watched a lot of sevens rugby that year and that was a ton of fun and uh, watched the last couple seasons of Game of Thrones with him so that was a good deal and then uh, and then I got in the camp the next year and I thought I was having a pretty good camp but they had paid another guy who's a good football player I'm not trying to take anything away from him a little bit more money than me so I ended up getting cut and then I basically was like an assistant tight end coach in Houston for eight weeks which was I was making full active salary and I didn't play it down and I just was like the coach for the two the two young guys so that was a super weird experience and I've never heard of another experience like that but it was uh, awesome would you think about going back and I know that you do the broadcasting side type now that you do radio um but would you think about maybe becoming like a tight ends coach in the future yeah I mean I had an opportunity this last offseason to maybe be an assistant line coach someplace and that would have been really really cool but you know I, I think one of the things about me when I played is I really committed a lot of time like I'd get to the facility at uh 5 a.m and I'd stay till nine every day and really was on the grind and, and despite me being there at five and leaving at nine the coaches were always there before me and they always left after me right and so I kind of want to take some time maybe a year or two uh to kind of spend some time with my family kind of recharge and kind of get that passion going again for football because like as much as I loved it it was a really challenging four years for my family and you know for me personally just being away and always kind of being unsettled so just trying to enjoy some time you know, with the people that I love, if that makes sense. That does make, that makes a lot of sense, especially when you're on the road and three times getting cut at one team is got to be tough. Yeah. Um, so now you do radio for the Washington football team. That's correct. Yeah. So I have to ask you some Washington football team questions. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So Washington football team kind of have an interesting draft lined up. Yep. Which way do you think they're going to go with the draft? Uh, I think that's a really, that's the million dollar question, right? right? Like, where do you go if you're in this organization? I think anybody looking at them for one second understands that their deficiency is at the quarterback spot. But right. when they pick in the mid of that first round, are they going to have a guy that's going to be high value and franchise changing? And then even when you look at these three guys at the top of the draft, outside of Lawrence, are any of them like surefire guys? I mean, 
I, I always get super leery, especially after the last couple of years. You look at those guys taken in the first round. Not all of them. Most of them, in fact, don't really pan out in a, in a very dramatic way. You're right. So I would say, like, you kind of got to go bargain bin shopping and have a really solid draft. And then, you know, look at the free agency market right now. I think L.A. just did a really smart thing getting Stafford in there. And I think if Washington could, could do something similar, I think that'd be pretty cool. But it just depends on what they're willing to give up to make that happen. But do you think L.A. might have given up a little too much to make that happen? That's a, that is a great question. I, I personally believe no. I think that team is an immediate Super Bowl contender with him. You know, okay. I, think, I, don't, I don't think I could say that about – if he had gone to any other team at that price, I would say probably no. Um, but I think they're kind of betting the farm here. This, this, it's this right. year or, or no other year, right? They're kind of in salary cap hell a little bit. And they got to make it happen yeah. now or never. So I think they – Unfortunately, that team was was Super Bowl bound, Super Bowl ready, but they were kind of held back by poor quarterback play, especially down the stretch of the season. Uh, you know, there's a guy with a PFF grade in golf of 40 percent over the last six weeks of the season, which is not what you want to be doing. So you upgrade that position to a guy who, in my opinion, has all the talent. Like if you watch his tape for five seconds, you're like, man, this guy is a special football player. Right. And because of that, he elevates that team immediately. Now he's never been that guy who can elevate a roster really but in my opinion he doesn't have to there because Sean McVay is there and Sean McVay is going to elevate him with his play calling elevate that group with his play calling so I think uh you know but like if, you know if, if I had said that if he had gone to Washington for that price I don't think that's the right call for yeah especially when Washington still has a bunch of guys that are young and, and kind of still getting established to the league like you're right the Rams have a lot of those guys have been in a Super Bowl before yeah mm-hmm. so. that's right and like you know I, I think like I was saying, I think Stafford goes there. It doesn't have to be everybody's hero, but here in, in Washington, he would have to, you know, he'd have to, he'd have to be winning games consistently. And, and to me, it's not that big of an upgrade over what they had in Detroit, what he, what he had around him in Detroit. So um, I think he made the right decision for himself. I think LA made the right decision, but if he had come here to Washington, I would have said that's a bad call for him and for the organization. Do you think Washington should maybe try to give like, Maybe a guy like Marcus Mariota, another shot, or 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 a guy like Tyrod Taylor could could maybe make because that defense is incredible, and they also yep. have some weapons in Washington, which I have to ask you about. Um, Logan Thomas, yep, who I think is one of the best tight ends in the league. I think that he's very underrated. Yes. Um, do you think that those guys could get them to the next level? Uh, that is uh, again great question a tough question because I think one of the things those guys have shown over their careers Mariota and Tyrod Taylor is that they are not elite quarterbacks and while I think they'd be a good stopgap maybe for a year or two until you found the guy you know built that roster even more through the draft hit on some more first round draft picks the same way you have with you know Payne Allen Chase Young Montez Sweat add another guy to the mix wherever receiver linebacker safety whatever that looks like um, and then do that twice, I think that roster looks a lot better. You're not going to go to Super Bowl with Tyrod Taylor. You're not going to go to Super Bowl with Marcus Mariota. But I do think it would it might stop the bleeding and make you eligible for the playoffs. I think it's important to keep in mind this team was seven and nine. You know, even yeah. in even in like other divisions, like they're not doing they're not making any kind of noise. They're they're yeah. a below average football team. So there's a lot of spots that need to be filled. And I think you know quarterback gets you the most. Um, get you the most quickly, but I don't think it's going to get you to be like a, a top team, a top um, 10, 15 team overnight. They have a lot of other holes they need to fill. And I think they need to consider that. Now, do you find even next season, say they go in, they get someone in the first round or they find like a serviceable veteran. Are yeah. they the team? Do you think Washington's the team to beat in, in the NFC East? So I personally, the team that makes me the most that that, in watching them, I think is the most kind of exciting going into next season is the Giants, to be totally honest. I think the Giants defense, they are really good. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I think I think Washington's defense gets a lot of credit, but I think that group has some characteristics of a dominant, dominant defense. I think they're like an edge rusher away from being like a top five defense. And I think they've got a couple young guys who are athletically gifted as pass rushers and they just need to develop a little bit. So that'll be really interesting to keep an eye on. And then obviously Daniel Jones, he's, he was the most consistent quarterback in the division. Yeah. So I know that's like insane to say a little scary. Yeah. But like to me, like he has got, he's like that guy. He's, he's got 
a good arm. He's got some mobility. He's got some athleticism. He seems to process the game well 80% of the time, and then you get those that 20% where he's doing disastrous, disastrous things. So if you can get that percentage up to 85 90%, and that defense adds and gets better, which I think they will, that's going to be a scary team to deal with. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I, I thought they were going to win the division this year, but then Washington kind of yeah. came out of almost nowhere. Um, all right. So talked a little bit about Washington, talked a little bit about your career. Now it's time for a game that we play on this show with all of our guests. It's called Steady Fire. We're, I'm going to ask yeah. you like random questions. Uh, some might be about football. Some might not be about football. Okay. Um, so I'll start off with what is your favorite home cooked meal? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I actually am a big spaghetti and meat sauce guy. Like my wife and my mom, they both know that like if I'm coming home, like when I travel from back from being away, that was always the meal that I want. And for whatever reason, I'm not Italian or anything like that. It just, it's the spot every time. Gotcha. Is, does it, uh, any dessert with it? Uh, so I'm a pretty clean eater. I know that, uh, like I don't eat a ton of dessert, but, um, if I were to pick a dessert, I'm a big, like ice cream guy. Okay. I, if I'm going to splurge on something, I'll have like a little, maybe half cup of ice cream. And that's something that really makes me super happy at night. You know what I mean? So awesome. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ice cream's a very good, uh, dessert. All right. Uh, if you, your dream person, your dream quarterback that you did not get to catch a, a touchdown from, but you would have loved to catch a touchdown from. Oh, that's a good one. Um, so I, I got to throw actually in college with Tom Brady and I got to like, be like the guy that, cause his agent was the offensive coordinator's son. So he'd come and train at UCLA. Oh, okay. So I got to play catch with him and I thought, man, it would be really cool to see his process after playing for 10 years. Like if I could go back one more time and just see how he does things on a day to day, not even catch a touchdown from just being in the same building with him, see how he studies, see how he sees the game. Like that was something really cool about my last couple of years kind of bounced around I got to see Jay Cutler Jimmy Garoppolo I got to see Matty Ice I got to see Deshaun Watson and all of those guys are good in their own way and just it would have been great to see how the greatest of all time could have done it and that would have been pretty sweet and Jimmy G's kind of like was his protege at one yeah, point yeah that's uh, right okay now I gotta ask you a question is Jimmy G the answer in San Francisco or do you think they gotta go my sister is from well she's from New York we're New Yorkers but Boston, uh, big Boston, like moved to Boston, became a huge New England fan. We disowned right. her. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but she wasn't like a Tom Brady fanatic. She is a Jimmy G fanatic. Right. So when he got traded, she was very upset. Yeah. Well, he's a, he's an attractive man. So that's what, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and he is a great dude. He's got a really cool leadership style. He's got a very talented arm. You know, I will say this, like I love Kyle and Kyle's offense is one of the best in the NFL, but he is right. super challenging on quarterbacks. And okay. that was one thing that I've been talking with Jimmy, like he said, he was having a hard time with the amount of responsibility Kyle was putting on him. And you can see that at times when you watch him on tape, like some of that greatness comes through that, that garnered that big deal from, uh, from that organization. Right. But at times you can tell he's got a lot going on. He's, he's digesting a lot. And I, uh, I don't know. I, you know, like I said, I've been it with Kyle for five years of my 10 year career and he does, he is very tough on quarterbacks and it, you need to be wired the right way. Like the best quarterback that he had and the most productive was Matt Ryan. And Matt Ryan is, you know, like a blue collar Philly guy, tough, right. mentally tough and can handle that stuff. And I'm not saying that Jimmy's not that way, but it takes a really special caliber of person to deal with the, the demands of that offense. Gotcha. Gotcha. Sorry. I had to digress from the game real quick, just to, to ask that question for you. Um, all right. So I'm going to bring you back. Hypothetical. You're back in college. You lose yes. every game for your four or five years that you're there. Yeah. But every year you, you play one team and you kill them. What team is that? Well, I went to UCLA. So I think everyone's going to know the answer to this and uh, USC. Okay. You yeah. Know, I think I've, I figured if we could that kill USC every year. I think that would be, you know, like I was a part of, uh, we had a bad year, my sophomore year, but we beat USC in a, in a Rose bowl. And, uh, it was one of the, it's, I mean, I remember it so vividly. One of the best memories of my college career was that game. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I figured it would be that answer, but still had to, <laughs> you never know. You gotta ask, right? Well, I'm going to put it now in the pro the, I will, we'll go with the, the Washington football team, formerly yeah. the Redskins. Uh, all five years, you lose every single game. 
But just say you play one team every year and you kill them. What what team is that? Yeah, so that's a good, that's an interesting question because it you know like in college you kind of have your you know the Pac-10 when I was there, Pac-12 now, um, and you kind of play the same teams, you build rivalries, you know guys, and in your division you kind of feel that same way. And when I played, our big rivalry, and a little bit is of it is because of how Washington Dallas. You know, like Dallas was the big, bad Jerry Jones. The owners had rivalries, you know, every year. Like when every time you played that game, we'd watch like this crazy highlight tape of the history of the game and get all hyped up for it. So that would be the one game that I felt like, you know, if we won that game, everything would have been fine if we were in Washington. But if I was looking more broadly around the NFL, especially when New England was rolling, I'd say New England because that's yeah. cool to have on your resume just to beat the beat the the best team in the NFL every year. Awesome. All right. So now I'm going from your receiving to your blocking technique. Yeah. If you get a pancake, any one of the defensive linemen, either past, present, oh, who would it be if you could pancake any one of them? Yeah. I mean, I think it'd be really cool to pancake Aaron Donald. I never would go against him, <laughs> but like I've seen what that guy does and he is like a buzzsaw of just like just moves and strength and athleticism and It'd be cool to get your hands on him and just feel that moment where he's tipping over backwards and you'd be like, yes. oh my God, here it is. It's happening right now. Um, in terms of guys that I played with, I uh, probably DeMarcus Ware. DeMarcus Ware was a little bit older than me. Okay. So I felt like he was always kind of picking on me when we played a little bit. Like he just was like that much better than me and he might feel differently about it. I don't even know if he remembers who I am, but like, you know, my first game blocking like was against him and he like, pushed me over a pile and I was just like, Oh my gosh, this guy's so strong and big. So to kind of make him feel that same moment of like terror and adequacy would be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Donald is by far like anytime we talk to like offensive linemen or tight ends or fullbacks, yeah. he is someone that is very widely said in that question. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Cause he's the it, best, you know, he, and he makes you, and he, he puts, you know, I've played, I played with guys who would stay up at night, like afraid to block him and play against him. And so to be able to kind of make him feel some of that fear you feel would be pretty cool. So we actually interviewed uh, Mike Carney, all, all pro uh, fullback. Yeah. And he said, and I, I wonder, cause you've also blocked against guys that the hardest guys to block against are wrestlers. Yeah, I think is that, that is true. true. Yeah. Wrestlers, uh, the guys who are the best blockers usually are wrestlers and the guys who are best defeating blocks are wrestlers. They just have a really nice feel for how to use their hands and use their body leverages. And uh, that like oftentimes that's not super intuitive to people and they've had a lifetime of, of wrestling to kind of cultivate that skill set. So Interesting. I, I would have never thought that. And then when he said it, it kind of made sense. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, did you have a tight end that you kind of mirrored your game after? Uh, I mean, I had a whole bunch of players that I admired and that I followed, um, you know, like the one that comes to mind was Jason Witten. And then uh, just because he was a guy that I always felt like was a little underhanded athletically, but he just did everything to a very high level. You know, he ran routes at a very high level. He blocked at a very high level and he not and he didn't rely solely on his athleticism, you know, and I think that's something that I always respected about the way he approached the game is he kind of took his his somewhat limited skills to limited by comparison to like George Kittle maybe but um you know he was an exceptional athlete but he kind of did every small thing the right way and that's something that I liked another guy that I liked to watch was uh Jerry Rice and that was just more of like a mindset thing you know like the way he handled his himself right. professionally so awesome all right it's just hypothetical here I give you a million dollars don't have it so can't give it to you but I give you a million dollars um you only have a half hour to spend it though. How are you spending it? Interesting question. So I'm actually trying to start a business and uh, there's a little bit of like upfront tooling costs and machining fees. And I've actually been looking into a whole bunch of financing options and different ways to kind of get that done that I don't have to pull it from my own pocket. So that million dollars, I would write the check immediately <laughs> and get it out there. Perfect. Right. If you gave it to me right now, it would be gone tomorrow. So um, yeah. I, I, that, that's because that's something that I feel really strongly and passionate about. And it's something that I feel very fulfilled doing. And yeah, if you got that million bucks, I'd love to get that from you. Yeah, unfortunately not. Uh, <laughs> just bought a house too. So it's probably. A, did you really? Congratulations. I did. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I wish I had it for that too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you have? Oh God, this is one of those ones I because I have a six year old son, so we talk about this like at nauseum but the one that i always think about is like uh, the ability to teleport and just how much time yeah. you can save like you know my parents live in california for example so oh, i could right. be like hey let's go get lunch and i just be there for lunch or i'd go over to my brother's house and then be back and i wouldn't have to you know or i got a meeting in, right. in dc and just i feel like i would just be so much more productive um the other one that's always really cool and it just I, i'm a huge fan of like strength sports like world's strongest man and things like that oh yeah. it'd be cool just to be like ridiculously strong you know what i mean and just yeah, like you could have pancaked demarcus Ware for sure yeah yeah everybody <laughs> right no yeah. nobody would have stood a chance or like go lift up a car or whatever like that'd be cool too but that's more like just for the optics of it like in terms of practicality i don't know if you can beat like um beat or like you know beat teleporting or maybe like some type of telekinesis or something like that where you can like yeah. read people's minds but yeah like practicality teleporting i'd say Awesome. All right. I got one last question for you. You're an NFL guy. Who's winning the Super Bowl this Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of figured that would come up. So, <laughs> you know, my parents are both from New England. And so I've grown up my whole life, you know, like New England, Tom Brady centric in my house, right. in my parents' house. Um, and so, like, I want him to win. I love the story that he's cultivated. This guy who's 43 years old, he seems to be ageless. He kind of goes wherever he wants. He makes the team better. He's got a winner's mentality, all that jargon, all those things. However, that being said, Kansas City's offense, I think, is just like another level above anybody else in the NFL. I think Tyreek Hill is almost unguardable. Travis Kelsey, same way. And then the then the uh, the the backups there they're not even backups but just like the hardman yes hardman um you know lair the running back Le'Veon bells the second string guy they just go across the board sammy watkins like and then patrick mahomes they haven't even talked about him and just how he elevates that whole roster also the, they have like a very good fullback too schwartz i believe his name is yeah, yeah. sherman I, sherman sherman, I sherman. yeah he's a guy yeah and you know, and you just kind of say, and then like, not only do they have a very talented roster offensively, but they have great play calling from Andy Reid and Eric bien yeah. So I think that alone, like when I just, when I watch them, I'm like, can a defense slow them down enough that the team's offense can hang with them? And if you go back to the, the first time these two met this year, like that was the case. Right. Tyreek Hill had like 275 yards receiving in the first half and just was unstoppable. And like, what do you do if you're Tampa in that situation? Like, how do you change who you are? to handle this because like they like to pressure a lot right and, like can you uh pressure Mahomes or is he just gonna like use his amazing escape ability and make you look like a fool so that's my one thing I think the defense for Tampa Bay is better but I don't think it really matters because I think the offense is that much better and I think Kansas City's defense is good enough to just slow down Tampa's offense I, I think it just comes down to having the best offensive football at this point Awesome. All right. Uh, Logan, thanks again for coming on. We're definitely going to have you on in the off season to talk about all the off season moves. Cause we know yeah. that you got, you know about that. Uh, James will actually be joining me next time he got stuck at work and I'm sure he would love to get your input too. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to let me talk with you a little bit. Awesome. Thanks so much. Best yeah, of man. luck. Uh, stay safe. Thanks man. That was Logan Paulson, absolutely awesome guy, uh, current radio host for the Washington football team, former Washington football team slash Redskins uh, player, played all around the league, obviously very intelligent about the game, and we were so lucky to have him on. Uh, that is it for tonight's interviews. Uh, James will hopefully be with me tomorrow. We got quite a set of interviews tomorrow, so stay tuned.